All right. Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Matt Miller. I'm a uh, advisor here at Versant Capital Management. We are a uh, wealth management firm in Phoenix, Arizona. We provide comprehensive wealth management to our clients, helping them live the lives they imagine. And uh, at the core of that is investments, of course. And I'm really excited because today I get introduced and uh, have a conversation with our founder and chief investment officer, Tom Connolly. Uh, no better person probably to debunk and break apart the topic we're, we're discussing today, cryptocurrency. Well, <laughs> crypto is kind of simple on the surface, but really complicated under the hood. Um, I like John Oliver's quote from his show on HBO, where he said, crypto is everything you don't understand about money combined with everything you don't understand about computers. Um, <laughs> I uh, That's a good quote, but... Um, I know uh, there are a lot of opinions on crypto out there. We're, we're going to be somewhat agnostic um, in our conclusion. Um, however, I, I can tell you, and I probably should tell you before we start, that me, I don't own any crypto uh, investments personally, and nor does the firm for its clients, uh, just in the interest of full disclosure. So in, the idea around crypto, the most the most frequently um, uh, coin or investment associated with crypto is Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin is really came, um, a creature of a software innovation. It uh, is comes about from a paper written in 2008 um, on, uh, uh, that initiated a concept called blockchain, a software concept. And basically, blockchain is a electronic ledger, a software protocol uh, that allows um, transactions to be entered indelibly into a, a software ledger that's maintained publicly out there on the internet. It's not a, a centralized um, a software platform. And the transactions are vetted and proved by independent entities, which you may have read in the press are called miners. And, and they uh, vet and add these transactions of buying and selling of Bitcoin to this blockchain ledger. Um, and if they are success, the ones successful in doing that, um, they get awarded Bitcoins. And so that's their incentive to keep doing so. So we have this decentralized software protocol out there um, that where the transactions are indelibly uh, transcribed Anybody can access it, uh, and it's not under the purview of any government or financial institution. So, so Tom, let me interrupt. So it's like a it's a substitute for money, but you, you touched on no intermediary. I think that's a really, really big thing, right? From a cost savings and uh, just the ability to exchange capital between people. Is that is that an interesting? Or what do you, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, it goes both ways on that. You. Um, you know, there are different kinds of investments in the crypto universe. Bitcoin is the one we've all heard about, but I'll get into those in just briefly in just a second. But yeah, the, the idea is this uh, ledger uh, decentralized. Um, if you ever see the abbreviation DeFi, D-E-F-I, that stands for, stands for decentralized finance and uh, the blockchain and Bitcoin are part of that. It does allow for the movement of capital outside fin traditional governments and financial institutions um, efficiently uh, in bulk. Um, and and uh, people from all over the world can engage in this. You can be from third world countries. You can be from developed countries. Uh, so that is, um, that is a big advantage of it. Uh, in terms of meeting expense, daily expenses of living, uh, there are a couple obstacles to that, which I'll I'll, I'll, I'll get into later. So it's, it's difficult to use uh, crypto um, for the most part for your uh, to pay your grocery bills, your you know fill right. up your car with gas. But uh, but you're right. It it can uh, affect movement of capital um, quickly and efficiently outside of uh, con uh, the traditional financial channels. Sure. So we're talking about it in terms of money. Uh, we're also going to spend some time talking about it from an investment standpoint. But real quick to end on the money, just one of the biggest 
issues with it, right? Is the volatility. And for something to be considered uh, money, typically, they, they typically say three things, right? It needs to act as a medium of exchange, store value, and act as a unit of account of value, meaning that last one, meaning it, when you get a dollar, you know it's worth a dollar. And I think that's one of the problems with the digital currency and cryptocurrencies now, correct? With volatility and seems like it's moving up and down all the time. Well, the, the volatility is intense. I think um, there are different types of crypto investments. So uh, things like Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, the two most by far popular coins, uh, the values are extraordinarily volatile. So, you know, we, for example, um, since 2012, you know, the, the price of Bitcoin has crashed 80% or more. Uh, three times. Um, and in 2017, there was a drop of 30% in one day. And of course, this year, uh, you know, we've had a tremendous volatility, a lot of it upward. But uh, just a few days ago, El Salvador was going to use uh, Bitcoin as a currency substitute in its economy. And the day after the Bitcoin fell as much as 17%. So it, it is a it is a characteristic of a currency when you when you go uh, into the bank or take out your checking book or your credit card and you go to the grocery store to buy your monthly groceries and you need uh, $200, um, you expect there to be $200, your, 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 uh, your unit of account in your, in your checking account or credit card to be worth $200. It can't be worth 100 or 50 right. or 300 or 400. So uh, Bitcoin um, uh, doesn't quite meet that test. However, there's a a realm of investments in crypto called stable coins, which are a type of coin that are typically linked to an underlying unit of value. So most of them are linked to the US dollar. Some are even linked to Bitcoin, but they they are much less volatile. Uh, so they're trying to get there. Are. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and so that, that, that's happening. And there are ATMs now in over 80 countries uh, I think uh, over 10,000 ATMs in up to 80 countries where you can exchange uh, Bitcoin for cash. Although again, you don't know what you're going to the exchange rate is going to be from day to day, and it's very right. volatile. So um, it, it's a it's a tough call uh, as a store of value. And the other thing is, you know, if you're transacting checks or credit cards, you have these wonderful intermediaries called sure. like Visa, which <laughs> net out transactions between vendors uh, and, and creditors um, so that you can transact and have it close at the point of sale. Right. There is no such intermediary right now in the Bitcoin universe. The and So it can take days to settle a transaction rather than what we're used to uh, in the uh -huh. grocery store. Mm -hmm. Well, let's switch gears then to uh, talking it in terms of investment. How you know, we custody a lot of our assets at Charles Schwab. How do people buy cryptocurrency? Can you buy it at Schwab or how are these people accessing it? No, you can't. Typically right now, and this is just all changing extremely rapidly, by the way. Sure. Um, uh, you, you, can, you can't really access it in public investments at this point in time. You can access funds that invest in derivative contracts like futures or options on crypto. Uh, those are relatively new. Um, you can also, there are also publicly traded, uh, exchange traded funds where you can buy the stocks of companies that um, are in the DeFi world, decentralized finance, which inc includes the cryptos, sells equipment to them or services equipment. You can do that. But uh, to buy um, uh, the actual crypto itself, you have to go out into the uh, DeFi universe to transact. And uh, um, so more and more institutions are starting to form up programs, partnerships, or access to crypto. The bigger financial institutions are trying to do that now. But um, for for most of us uh, going through the traditional financial channels, it's it's not it's possible cool. to buy, yeah. Well, from an investment standpoint, how do you, how, do you, how should we think about it? Um, I like to think of it, and I've heard people call it digital gold. You know, it doesn't produce income. It doesn't have a revenue stream like a company. We invest in gold. How do you differentiate the two? And uh, how do you relate those two when you think about those? Well, 
So like gold, uh, Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin is supported entirely by belief. If you invest in gold, I mean, gold doesn't gold doesn't pay dividends, interest, cash, rents, royalties, any source of ongoing income while you hold it, like a stock or a bond or real estate would. Right. Now, uh, classical financial theory tells us that the value of an investment is approximately the future cash flows uh, discounted back to the present. Um, you know, the principle is of the further out, you know, a dollar in the future is less worth than a dollar in your hand today. And so the further out in the future you sure. go, the, the more that penalty is. But you don't have any income from gold or crypto. And so how do you value it? Well, with gold, um, we know that gold has been used as a store of value both in the form of a currency and backing currencies for, you know, depending on what you read, three, four, even 5,000 years. Um, and even today, you can see in countries that have uh, acted somewhat irresponsibly with printing too much of their currencies, uh, for someone in those countries, gold has held up value in value extremely well against these depreciated currencies. Um, there is no such history with crypto, however, uh, What's interesting about crypto, theoretically, you know, the supply of gold could increase uh, with mining activity. I mean, if gold went up to $10,000 an ounce, you'd see a flurry of activity and probably an increase in the amount of gold out there. But uh, take Bitcoin, for example, the Bitcoin is limited to producing 21 million Bitcoins. And there's only, I think it's like 18 and a half million out right now. Um, and the miners who, who, vet these the transactions that go on with Bitcoin every day uh, at current or anticipated rates of mining uh, that supply the 21 million will be hit in 2140. So you actually have a, a limited supply in Bitcoin, whereas in gold or any other investment uh, or currency, you don't. A government can print as much currency as it wants, whereas uh, now uh, a word of warning there on the limitation in Bitcoin is that you have um, hundreds of coins, not just Bitcoin. There's Ethereum and a whole bunch of others that are competition. So the, they're to the extent that they are substitutable, you, you do have comp Bitcoin has competition from other similar types of coins. But Bitcoin itself is limited. No one can print it. Or, or abuse the value, no one can alter the transaction record. Um, so, you know, if, as long as people believe it has value, um, right. you know, those are really good features. And then the transact, the ability to transact it outside of the financial system or the governments at the present time um, is another uh, very big and important factor um, to maintaining its value, but ultimately, like gold, it's 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 the ultimate speculative investment because it, it's 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 a value in the future is what someone in the future is, believes it'll be. It's willing to pay, right? So in one sense, it's governed by the greater fool theory on returns that for you to make a positive return, it has to uh, generate be a, be a, of more value in the future because you won't earn any income on it um, unless you lend it out for someone else to use and they pay you income, which is an, something else that's happening uh, happening a lot more in, increasingly today as well. Um, sure. So, so uh, one uh, observer out there in the scene, Nassim Taleb, uh, who, who's author of Fooled by Randomness and the Black Swan, posits that um, if an investment over its lifespan has any chance of 100% loss, in other words, people losing confidence in it and it loses all its value at some point in time uh, and it doesn't pay interim cash flows, the present value is zero. Uh, and that's a pretty amazing right. proposition, but uh, it's true. Now, gold, we know that has a long story past to be in a store of value. Um, Certainly uh, not as volatile, right? Right. Oh, the volatility issue. Can I can I say a couple things on that? Hey, it's to your floor, Tom. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> So I already mentioned the, the extreme volatility, but just for comparison, monthly volatility um, over the past few years, or I think it's the past 10, 
uh, has been between 20 and uh, rolling monthly volatility, about 20 to 25 percent. That's monthly volatility. Um, and, and the monthly volatility for things like equities and gold is 5 percent or less. So it's uh, the recent history of uh, Bitcoin is four or five times as volatile right. as stocks or gold. So it's difficult to posit it as a. Um, right. Well, this is, uh, you, you alluded to this at the beginning, and, and maybe this is kind of a good way to wrap it up. Tom, you, I, I like to tell clients that we diversify diversification. We look for things that are uncorrelated to the market, uh, things like reinsurance and some other things that you and your team are looking at all the time. Is this something that's certainly not correlated to equity markets per se? Is this something that you're looking at? And I, I, again, I think we know the answer to that, but uh, is this something clients can expect to see in their portfolio soon? Well, the the volatility is such that we're not even sure that things like volatility and correlation are defined with this investment. First of all, secondly, if um, if it simply has an investment return based on what someone will pay for it in the future, um, and not interim cash flows that we can discount at least estimate a value. Uh, and and it's go that's governed by the greater fool theory. One has to say, if you're an investment advisor or person who holds them out as a fiduciary, it may not even be an appropriate asset to invest in for a fiduciary. Um, so for those reasons, I'm not sure we can say if it will be a diversifier. And a proper investment that's a diversifier has to have a positive return expectation of some kind, which we're not sure Bitcoin will have Um Sure. especially from its current levels. So that's the reason at this point in time, we're not recommending uh, Bitcoin uh, or other crypto investments. Um, if we were to, uh, if we were to recommend investments, it would probably be more along the lines of investing in the stocks of companies that provide services or uh, equipment to the crypto industry. Right. Um, but, with respect to investing directly in crypto, um, it's extremely speculative in our view, um, and it, it may continue. It may be successful. Uh, my guess is, you know, maybe one or two Bitcoin, and Ethereum. They might turn out to be successful, even world changing, or they might flame out and go to zero. Especially when governments would uh, or continue to knock at the door and say, "Hey." Uh, if you're active with U.S. citizens, we need you need to be regulated. Plus, investors need to pay taxes on the gains from these investments. Um, how that will work with a decentralized platform with, that prides itself on being outside government or financial the, the impediments in the financial system? How that all plays out, right? Nobody knows. But uh, so well, we don't. That, there's we don't negatives. Plan to use it. There's negatives to your point, Tom, right? I mean, I think a lot of illegal art dealings and things like that. I mean, decentralization has its benefits, but uh, comes with a little bit of the Wild West currently. And uh, I think they're trying to figure that out as well. Yeah, I think it is a Wild West. Um, be, and the regulators uh, have, are out there on record saying we want to take a closer look and sure. bring this in a bit. Um, so the outcome from that is unknown but actually you know when you get right down to it this is the creation of money out of nothing uh, it's really difficult for me to believe you can you know the the crypto valuation right now is north of one trillion dollars um from nothing out of a software protocol you know it's difficult to believe you can get something for nothing to that degree on an on you know on an ongoing basis and remember that all this crypto Ex this crypto explosion that's happened here in the last year or two, it's the third big rally uh, I'm, um, is happening during a time of of um, speculation that may be the greatest we've seen in securities and other markets in modern times. So it's not surprising that all the government um, uh, credit creation and money creation is finding a place to go and crypto might be one of those. So, uh, yeah, yeah. let me let me put you on the spot, Tom. Forget the investments uh, since you're so well read. I think people always value your opinion. Do you think crypto are we going to be using are your kid? 
uh, are my kids going to be using cryptocurrency, digital currencies in the future? Is that the thing in the future? And will the dollar go away someday? Uh, look, I think it, that's very possible. I don't. I don't think the dollar will go away. There'll be the dollar or some. The U.S. might even by that time have a digital currency. You know, India is trying to do that. Um, you know, they they will probably be in a digital currency environment of some kind. You know, but the dollar has backing. It has the f- full faith and credit of the U.S. Plus, a, a mach- uh, they can print as much currency as they want. So the U.S. can never go bankrupt. Although they, you don't know, never know what the dollar is going to be worth if they do that. But sure. um, you know, it, it could be dollar. It could be Bitcoin. I, I mean, I, I said at the outset, I'm a little agnostic. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, some of these things could be extremely successful in a in a part of the global financial system or ecosystem in the future. I just don't know, but I, I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't bet my clients money sure. on it. You know, uh, I don't know which currency, stable coin, token, NFT or whatever investment is going to be the winner out of the thousands out there now. Um, uh, yeah. So it's, it's just too dangerous to, put our clients money at risk on something like this that doesn't pay interim cash flows. Sure. Yeah. We all are entitled to an opinion, but uh, whether yep. we act on that or not, I don't know. Um, well, Tom, I think that wraps it up as far as the things I wanted to, to ask you today. Uh, I would just want to encourage our viewers. Uh, if you have any questions, I, first off, I hope this was helpful. Um, if you have any questions to reach out to your advisor, reach out directly to even Tom, and uh, one of us will, will get those answered right away and get back to you. Uh, but thanks for, uh, for showing up today and uh, have a nice rest of your week. Thanks. Yeah, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you all very much for your time.